welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round member screening series, Film Independent Presents. My name is Jen Wilson. I'm a senior programmer uh, here at Film Independent. Thank you to uh, Film Independent Presents lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. The HFPA has been an ardent supporter of, our, of this program for many years, and we're so thankful for their support. Thank you to our new virtual screening partner, Vision Media. Make sure to check out Film Independent Calendar to see what virtual screenings we have coming up. Just a note to anybody watching today, there is a question button at the bottom of the screen. So if you'd like to submit a question for our moderator to ask the guests uh, um, towards the end of the Q&A, please go ahead and do that. And now please welcome today's moderator. She's Janelle Riley, Deputy Awards and Features Editor at Variety. And she's received two Emmy Awards for her work on Variety PBS's Actors on Actors series. Welcome, Janelle. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And I am a member of Film Independent, by the way. Um, oh, good for you. You know, I, I love your programs and I get to vote in the Spirit Awards. So um, if, I'm welcome to bribes, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so thrilled to be here today for this Q&A with The Morning Show. I absolutely love the show, devoured it when it premiered uh, late last year. Um, and at this time, please join me in welcoming two of the standout stars of the series, Billy Crudup and Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Hi. 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 Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, whenever I have people as accomplished as you are, I actually like to go back to the beginning and ask, what was your first job as an actor? The first time, you know, you either got paid for it or, or felt you could finally call yourself an actor. Uh, you go, Billy. Oh, all right. <laughs> Um, well, my, my first paid job was as a reenactor on, on a, um, um, it was a replica of a 16th century ship in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Um, and so uh, vacationers would come pay uh, admittance and there was five of us on board who would act like we were the sailors on the ship and speak with phony accents and teach them about um, what it's like to live in the 15th century. No way. Sorry, 16th century. Wow. Did you have a script or were you improvising in 15th century? We were improvising. Like we, we were meant to build, oh, by the way, and this was for over $4 an hour. So I felt like super, <laughs> there, there's a, there was a whole um, audition process when I was in college called the Outdoor Theater Festival Auditions. And it, it they sort of like shotgun approach. You go in, you do one minute in front of, a hundred uh, people who have various theaters uh, or theater festivals throughout the States. And then a couple of them will interview you. And that was the one that was closest to where I was in school at Chapel Hill. And uh, I thought paid the most. So I, I, <laughs> I, took, I took that job and ended up um, cooking and washing dishes at night to make the ends meet. But uh, Thomas Latham, in case you were wondering, was the name of my character. <laughs> You had a character with a backstory. He was, the, he was the bosun's mate. Yep. Uh, oh yeah, I had to learn about knots and stuff. And somebody made the choice. I'm sorry, this is going on, but I haven't thought about it forever. But somebody made the choice that our action, our accents, um, were, were such that people at that time in the 16th century would have pronounced the silent K um, in front of words like "cano." <laughs> I don't cano what you're talking about. No. <laughs> and so. Um, we, I, I worked super hard, very diligent on building the character and about two weeks into it, um, we all got bored and, you know, we went from, uh, teaching people about knots with our silly accents to saying, can you please get out of the cabin? Do you see that the sailor is sleeping in here? <laughs> so, uh, that was my first brush with acting. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes mine sound a bit dull. Well, my first, uh, it was also an open air period, but I was uh, playing uh, Celia in As You Like It uh, in an open air production um, at the, in the, in the sort of moat of a, of a castle in Exeter. Uh, <laughs> so it was like it was sort of you know kind of Shakespeare in the parky, but it was it was it was regional. So it was you know Shakespeare in in the in the castle moat, and um, yeah, it was it was amazing. We sort of skipped off to the the Forest of Arden, you know, in in the back of the in the in the castle grounds, and um, you know we sort of performed through rain, through 
pigeons through all sorts but um yeah I was just happy to kind of have a paid job out of drama school that's amazing mm -hmm. um and all that way to the morning show I love it <laughs> uh this is one of the first shows on Apple TV plus um I'm curious how you first sort of heard about it and what attracted you to your roles uh, Billy I I think I heard that you kind of had to campaign for the role of Corey um yeah well um I, I remember being approached because I share the uh, same agent and uh, manager as Jen and she came and saw a play that I was doing in New York and sort of intimated that there was a project that she was working on but people really like being clandestine about all of the you know pre-production stuff so there was a whole bunch of you know head shakes and maybe there's something in it you know and I didn't really know what any of it meant and obviously as an actor you don't trust that anything is ever going to happen until it's actually come out because you can audition for the part, you can lobby for the part, you can shoot the part and then the movie comes out and you're not in it. So I, I never um, I count, count on anything, but Jen said, um, maybe there's a part in it for you. And shortly thereafter, maybe a month or so after she sent me the script and the material itself was something that I typically gravitate towards that that uh, socially aware, articulate, uh, entertaining, um, uh, well-written uh, material like broadcast news and stuff that I grew up on uh, that it, it depended upon character work to kind of illuminate all of the themes that they're trying to explore uh, appealed to me immediately. And since I... It, I get most excited about things that I don't understand, which is a lot. Um, but the, uh, the character of Corey, I couldn't quite understand. Uh, so I, I, I started fixating on, on him, trying to figure out what could possibly make someone think that that's an okay way to act in the world. And um, that curiosity uh, never left my, um, the, the front of my mind. And so when they asked which part, um, it, it originally had been written for somebody much younger or, or younger. Um, and so it took a little bit of convincing um, for me to uh, suggest a, a, an alternate a point of view for somebody in their in their 50s. Really? Wow, that's amazing. What was it about you that just spoke to the character? Was it was it just that you you were trying to figure him out? Well, somebody who has that kind of entitlement, uh, anybody who speaks in volumes like that, it, it, it must assume that their audience at, at least um, has to be attentive or is interested. And because his ideas were so firmly um, entrenched in his way of thinking and his way of thinking was so contorted, it t took him a while to explain it to people. So what is gonna make anybody sit there and listen to somebody for that long? Mm -hmm. Especially when his ideas are so kind of outlandish and, mm -hmm. and, and brash often. Um, so the, I, I immediately thought of all the operators in New York that I've met through my 30 years being here who are constantly working angles in any given room to try to figure out the power structure so that they they can service their own ambition. And Gugu, for you, what uh, interested you in the role of Hannah? Well, I I was sent the first two scripts initially, and um, you know Hannah's in there, but there's not as much. You know, you don't really get a, a chance to see where she's going in the first two. And I obviously knew about the cast that were attached, and I think. Um, that was really exciting for me. And, and the quality, like, like you said, Billy, the quality of the writing was just so great. It was, had, it was so gleeful and, you know, the sort of narcissistic delight and everybody was, um, I just loved the rhythm of the language. It just had that really New York muscular kind of a, a playful energy to it as well, which I thought was, was really interesting and that it was really about something so topical. Um, and then I got on the phone with Kerry Erin, the showrunner, and Mimi Leader, our main director, and they basically pitched me the whole of Hannah's particular arc over the phone. Um, so, and that just gave me chills. I just thought it was such a powerful and important storyline. And 
something that I hadn't seen explored on a TV show before from, from that perspective. So, so I was just, you know, really excited. I just thought it was going to be a, a challenging, you know, role and there was going to be lots to talk about. And, um, and again, just the chance to work with this incredible cast. I mean, this cast is amazing. And, and, you know, Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon starts at the top. Um, but you also have Steve Carell and Mark Duplass. It's just every role is is filled with an amazing actor. And, and Billy, you get to sing with Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> I mean, what did you think when you heard that? Uh, uh, <laughs> this seems like a bad idea. I mean, I guess that was my original thought. But uh, it, it didn't seem ultimately any more extravagant than any of the other monologues that she had written for me. So it, it seemed to be an extension of, of some kind of, I don't know, exorbitance or whatever it was that Carrie was after expressing in this, uh, in this character. And um, so I just got straight to work on doing the best that I could and, and counted on the fine technicians at um, Capitol Recording Studios to uh, use their auto tune and uh, to its, its greatest potential uh, I also called my um, the my singing teacher from graduate school, who was unsuccessful in teaching me to 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 sing, uh, because I I really I, I, I deeply wanted to have that um, that skill set, and uh, I I have to say she has been really really successful at allowing me to be able to at least record something um, that can work in a narrative in this way. Um, so that was a pretty uh, exciting uh, event for me. Did you sing live in front of that entire crowd of extras and crew? Well, I did, Janelle, but I don't know that they recorded that. Uh, <laughs> I was so gutted because I wasn't in that scene. And as soon as I read that in the script, I was like, this is so brilliant and weird and amazing. And I didn't get to see it on the day. So I'm... I was just staring at Nestor and Deshaun, who were just cracking up uh, <laughs> off camera. I knew how insane the entire thing was but actually the, the the part that was fascinating not just recording at Capitol Records which I mean you walk by pictures of Marvin Gaye and um I saw him in concert actually in in in, in Dallas uh when I was much younger and so to be there recording was a, just an unbelievable uh experience for me just in a novel form but then the the interplay between Jen and I when we, when we were actually shooting it um ended up being a, a really exciting creative experience, Be, watching these two people try to navigate uh, the system of power between them um, in the context of this like, you know, upper class socialized um, environment, I found uh, uh, really rewarding from a creative standpoint. Gugu, did you try to convince them that maybe Hannah should be invited to this party? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. I can't, you know what, I think, in all truth, I can't remember which episode was that, Billy. I can't remember which number episode. You know, uh, I, I couldn't early. tell you. But I was I was back and forth early because I was also filming Misbehavior in London. So there, <laughs> Hannah may have been invited to that party in, in the first <laughs> in the first um, draft. But but I um, early on in the season, um, I was also doing uh, a filming in London. So I, I came back and forth two or three times, which is so mad to think even now in our quarantine existence, you know, how much I was jumping on planes to try and finish this job and start this other one. So, so there were, you know, um, no, otherwise I, I would have tried to, to at least just stand at the back uh, and, and get a, a seat to that show for sure. Uh, I think everyone has probably seen the show at least once, um, maybe a couple times. So I might get into a little bit of a uh, spoilery content, um, but I want to talk about your scenes with Steve Carell. Um, because they are wrenching and difficult to watch. And I just can't even imagine what it's like filming scenes like that. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, knowing that Steve Carell is one of the nicest people in the universe helps. <laughs> um, and that you were able to, you know, maybe have some levity on set even while doing these difficult scenes. Yeah, I mean, going back to the script, I mean, I think specifically starting really for my character in episode eight, where we have the, that flashback episode, which is really, you know, the first time that you get to understand the backstory of, of Hannah's, Hannah's journey um, and, and what has gone on with her and, and the Mitch character. And um, yeah, I mean, it was so well written and it was so nuanced. And I think, 
um, also working with Michelle McLaren on that episode, who came in just specifically to do all of that stuff, you know, in Vegas in the hotel room, and and um, it was it was really important. And I think you know Steve is so smart and he's so dexterous with the language, and he is has such a range. You know, obviously, I think he's such a likable actor, and I think that's the genius of him being cast in in that part you know because it was so conflicting um you know how he abuses his power in in that in those moments um so yeah um but but you know we all sort of had a lot of conversations about how those scenes were going to be um shot and um you know i felt like after all of the build up of the show you know that we know this this sexual predator you know what he we hear so much about him and we hear so much about what has gone on um but i think it was really bold of the show to actually you know in sort of minute detail just sort of uh, zero in on a, on a moment like that and see it from so many different perspectives as well. I'm guessing both of you have probably been guests on a morning show before um, but I don't know if there was any special preparation you put into these roles like if you know if you shadowed a producer or a booker or if there were people you talked to I also know it's based on a book I'm curious if that was a resource. I did read the book, um, but unfortunately, again, I, just because of the essence of time, I would have loved to have um, had a chance to shadow, but because I was in London some of the time and, you know, coming straight off another job, I didn't have as much chance to do a, a deep dive into that world. But luckily I had experiences to draw on um, from, from being on some of those shows ever so briefly as a guest. So. <laughs> Billy, for you? Uh, no, I, I like to do as little work as possible. So uh, <laughs> I memorized my lines, made sure my shirt was tucked in, and uh, get ready for action. I, I the, the actually the 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 character was so extravagant. Like, who am I going to talk to? You know, <laughs> who's going to teach me about this guy? I, I I've never specifically met this guy. I kind of pieced them together, um, but it was an invention of, of Carrie. And uh, it's not imagine. true that you do as little work as possible because I remember seeing your script. I, I <laughs> yes, I, I do a, a lot of work uh, myself trying to parse through what exactly the narrative intention is and how yeah. I can try to render it. But in terms of uh, you know, like um, going to meet executives and things like that, I didn't feel I, su I suppose if it was a different circumstance, and there has there have been other things that I've worked on where. It, it has been helpful to meet actual practitioners of whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, but with this one in particular, it seemed to me that I wanted to understand the narrative function first and uh, his own psychology. And that was really a question of parsing through the text and making sure that I was aligned with Carrie and what her in, in, enterprise was for telling this story. Where, where, where should we trust Corey? Where should we doubt Corey? Where can we be unclear? Um, where can he obfuscate who, what his motivations are? And that became a, a really wonderful uh, collaboration for me with um, Mimi and Carrie and all of our producers about trying to figure out who this person was in the story. Because ultimately what we're trying to tell is the story of um, disrupting the power structure. And so uh, if the person who is in a position of power is um, keeping everybody on their toes with, with uh, op obfuscate his own motivations, um, that makes for a really interesting landscape for people to try to ascend power or claim power, hold on to power. And um, if the person like Corey delights and revels in that position, it makes it entertaining for an audience to watch. So she was writing specifically to that personality. So all of my work was just trying to get her uh, incredible uh, efforts to the, um, to, the, to the screen. What do you call it? What are we doing? Now? To the computer? Streaming service. Uh, <laughs> you just monitor. made me feel, <laughs> you just made me feel a lot better about enjoying Corey so much because I've, I've right. been surprised and I've talked to a lot of people who are like, I don't know if like is the right word, but we really enjoy watching this guy. Yeah, understandably. And um, I, 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 it has always been, and, and I, don't, I don't like to be uh, dictatorial about like what my character is or how he should be received or how the piece should be received or what it is. I, I think we put it out there and it's up to the audience to decide what it is. And, uh, but I, I would like to, um, 
to say that one of the, the interesting aspects of, about somebody like that um, who thrives in a vacuum of uh, power um, and somebody who thrives in a condition of chaos is that it can be incredibly entertaining and it can go south really fast. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep your uh, eyes and ears open for these kinds of people um, because they can take advantage of situations, uh, particularly if they have a facile mind like Corey does in ways that um, y y you're unprepared for. Uh, the show is is very funny in the way that life is funny, um, but it also obviously deals with these big issues and, and isn't afraid to, you know, tackle some some uh, important topics. I'm kind of curious, um, what was the the atmosphere like on set? Like when you're doing these heavy scenes, were you able to have level levity? I mean, you have some of the funniest actors ever working on it. Were you guys able to to joke around between scenes? Was it was it generally a fun set? I mean, I had fun. It's funny because I, I feel like I was sort of, my sort of role and Hannah as the booker of the show is kind of in and out. She was sort of, you know, that that they felt like there were different different worlds, you know, between, you know, Jen and Reese and, and the, the characters that are in front of the camera and then those, you know, behind behind the scenes. But, um, but you know, such, such an amazing cast. And I think, you know, I always enjoyed, you know, Belle Powley, you know, fellow Brit on, on, the, on the set as well. You know, we share a similar sort of sense of humor. And, um, you know, even though a lot of the scenes for me got, you know, much more intense as the, as the show went on. I think, you know, you always felt like, you felt supported by the ensemble, you know, um, and, and the, the energy in the hair and makeup trailer, you know, from Deshaun and Karen and Mark and everybody, you know, was always um, felt warm. You know. Yeah, I found it um, rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, it was super light for me because, uh, that 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 it's a hard character for me to play because he thinks a lot faster than I do and speaks a lot faster than I do and has to manage situations that uh, I can't fathom. And so to do that in the space of somebody who's working incredibly uh, dynamically from a cinematic point of view, like Mimi, who's staging all of these wonders, um, where she has choreographed this incredible shot where Duplass is, is leading everybody through, um, you know, the control room. And then I kind of, you know, sneak out at the end and have to give them this monologue about seals. Um, that, that is not in my comfort zone. That is um, terrifying. So uh, my, my I, I was more like studious. I was trying very um, hard to not screw up the entire machine. And uh, the, 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 the fun came on the drive home, feeling like, <laughs> oh, we had accomplished something today. We actually, we made that that crazy event happen. Now I've seen you do like three hour Tom Stoppard plays. So I find it hard to believe that you were stressed out by monologues. Well, let me tell you, one of the things about plays is you get five weeks rehearsal. Um, when you're doing a television show, you can memorize it all you want. But when you get to set that day, that'll be the first time you're actually interacting with the people around you. And the way that I typically work is I, I like to collaborate. I don't want to dictate what my performance is before. I need to feed off the other actors. I want to know what the director's doing, all the things that become features of the characters' lives, the uh, tactile things I, I want to make use of. But I need time to do that. And so when you have no time to do that and you must deliver something in the moment, um, it, uh, it, it, it definitely... Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an amazing, wonderful, sweaty challenge. <laughs> uh, I'm curious because I don't know, have you guys already shot season two? We started, we were a couple weeks in and uh, then, then we shut down, obviously. Uh, I mean, is there anything you can tell us or, or will Apple come after you if you spill anything? It is amazing. <laughs> know i'm curious to know how or if they're going to address the pandemic in the season because i'm sure you, you know like every show that has is set now and within the world of news you know because uh, and i have no idea so and i'm not involved so i can just guesstimate but 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 you know how how certain shows set now 
that are supposed to be very much about what we're all going through in the world, how, how they're going to be rewritten to deal with, you know, how you're shooting a TV show, you know, with masks or social distancing, you know, all the stuff that you actually do, you know, cause, cause it would be confusing for us even on set just with all the cameras, because there would be the cameras that are, you know, and then there would be the, you know, the, the, the show within the show cameras and you suddenly be like looking into the wrong thing. I mean, sometimes there'd be sort of, you know, six cameras on set and you just, it's, it's a lot. Um, so yeah, I'm curious. Very meta, the show within the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have so many audience questions. I actually want to get started on them a little early. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance if I butcher anyone's name. Um, we have a question from Travis. Wants to know if you like to improv while filming or do you feel more comfortable staying on script? Oh, and, and related, do you ever feel comfortable suggesting major or minor changes to the script for your own character and how another character may interact with yours? Hmm. <laughs> um, it, for me, improvising dialogue in an American accent is 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 harder. Uh, I I feel like everything is improvisational in the moment, but I like to feel secure in the structure, especially when I'm doing a, another dialect. Um, I mean, I can often there'll be a line changed on the day or something like that, and that's fine. But I. Um, I, I, I am happy to improvise, but I'm, I'm more comfortable doing it in my own accent. <laughs> so if we were improvising a lot, Hannah would suddenly get very, probably get very British. But um, yeah, I can't remember the rest of the question, but. Um. <laughs> I feel the same. Improvising in an American accent is a nightmare. Um, I don't, I am not, I tip, like I was saying before, I like the script. I like understanding the script and there. That being said, um, Mark Duplass is incredible at improvisation. And uh, he, he's the first person that I've encountered that really made me feel comfortable at, uh, at knowing what our touchstones were in the scene, making sure that we made certain events happen between us, and then uh, discovering if there was anything more uh, for us to add. Uh, sorry, um, it's, it's starting to downpour here in New York. So oh, if you're really? hearing rain outside, yeah, it's just on my roof. Um, but the... Uh, the, the spirit of improvisation with Mark was uh, a totally new welcome discovery. And he, he to, to sort of be led through it with such uh, comfort um, and support by him made for a really excellent uh, experience for me. And Carrie was supremely open, um, as was Mimi and the rest of the producers, to any ideas we had. And mostly what I had was questions for her. So anything that wasn't clear, she helped me to sort of navigate it. Uh, we have a question from Leslie for both of you. Wants to know if there's something you didn't have a chance to explore in your character that you would like to, given the time and opportunity. Hmm. <laughs> if there, if, if, could you say the first part of that again? Sure. Um, is there something you didn't have a chance to explore in your character that you would oh. like to? Yeah, his dancing. <laughs> I, I, we did this singing, but uh, I have a whole backstory about him as a morning poet. show, the musical yet yeah. to come. Please, please, yeah, please I mean, episode. that was the amazing thing about even just you know the layers of the show when we did episode eight and we had these dancers and that that whole sort of number you know to celebrate Mitch's birthday was just oh my god yeah they really went there with you never know season two Billy you may get your your dance number in. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Sarah. Uh, you addressed this a little bit. Well, first of all, she wants you to know, Billy, that you're one of her favorite actors. Um, Thank who you, Sarah. Um, my question for both of you is, I love hearing about actors' processes. Would you share a bit more about how you worked on creating your characters or how you like to prepare for a day on set? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I guess, you know, for me on this show that, that, you know, that some, some days were lighter than others, you know, and, and certainly when I had more of my intense scenes, um, I think, you know, just like you, you were saying, Billy, you know, when you have the dialogue, when, when the, when the language is this muscular and, you know, I certainly had, you know, especially towards episode 10, you know, one exceptionally long sort of scene with Reese, you know, um, which sort of the emotional sort of, um, climax for Hannah's sort of journey and you know really just 
working on the lines. I know it's such a ba basic actor actor thing, but you know, I think with Kerry's writing, you know, there is there's just there's the speed at which you know, and that that adrenalized New York sleep deprived world that they're all in, you know, it has to exist in a, in a certain on a certain pace and um you know that that's sort of you know um number one for me and then just you know emotionally um for some of the more um emotional scenes i you know i listen to a lot, a lot of music on set i find that really um helps sort of still me and get me into a, a sort of receptive place um and and then and then just kind of showing up and just you know we, again with these amazing actors you know you, I think just being in the moment you know some some of the time when we were even filming in places you know that were not really locked down like like you know Las, the Las Vegas Strip for example you know you're you're out there and you're you know doing night shoots and you're just you know staying awake and staying present to the the random people <laughs> that are coming towards you and you're just existing so um you know it's kind of being prepared and then being loose uh, as well you know do you have yeah, a I feel similarly you just have you, you you want to be so prepared I'm sorry did I interrupt you no, no not at all please I can't hear you really through the hailstorm that's happening above me at the moment but uh um the uh I, I feel similarly as Gugu you you want to be become come to the day as prepared as you possibly can be without ever having encountered the other actors in the scene mm. so that you can get to a point where you're comfortable with the camera work, where you're comfortable um, with yourself and whatever new space you're in so that you can pay attention to the other actors because it's a real gift to be able to work with people who are so available and so talented that you know that if you are prepared and present, you're gonna create something between you that wasn't on the page, that wasn't in your mind, but was like the best of all of those things together. And I feel like um, we had that opportunity m more times than I can count on this, which is a real creative blessing. I can't believe there's a hailstorm because I don't hear anything, but also you have like brightness coming in through your windows. Yeah, it's um, it, little pockets of uh, thunderclouds dropping hail up there. And God, it certainly I sounds like it. I'm not sure. I, I can't hear it at all. I haven't seen hail in like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of miss it weirdly. <laughs> um, we have a question from uh, W.C. Stewart. Uh, wants to know, oh, what TV and movies have you been watching in quarantine? Have you guys been able, I mean, aside from the morning show. Um, I haven't, I've done more reading and... Uh... I haven't watched a ton. I, I loved Normal People. I hoovered that up. Um, I just found that so intimate and um, I just I just loved it. Um, and I watched a show called Unorthodox on Netflix, which I also really enjoyed. Um, yeah, both very intimate actor driven things um but i haven't i haven't watched it a ton considering how much time there's been i just i've been trying to do things that i don't normally do and trying to you know trying to read and and um paint and you know just flex other muscles so i haven't watched that much oh wait um no, yeah, I heard I, did you hear that <laughs> i've been doing a lot of reading and painting too sure <laughs> um I'm starting businesses and really taking advantage of this quarantine. <laughs> um, I, I did actually start watching uh, and finished watching Ozark, uh, which I hadn't seen before. I'm a huge uh, Jason Bateman fan um, and Laura Linney as well. And uh, so that, that was exciting to watch. But my son and I have really enjoyed watching um, as many uh, silly movies as possible. So uh, a lot of um, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley, um, <laughs> sort of. That, that's when when Netflix comes on, uh, you can guarantee that Step Brothers is going to be like a hundred percent match for what we're looking for. <laughs> so the more the more of that, the merrier for the two of us. Have you seen Will Ferrell's one that came out over the weekend, the Eurovision? No. Hey, we've got a new one to watch. <laughs> Oh, you're going to love this one. Eurovision. <laughs> Look it up. Uh, we have a question from Sarah Beth. Uh, wants to know, in your careers thus far, what would you say is the ratio of projects you work on that deeply inspire you versus projects you take on because they're jobs? Have you ever personally struggled between artistic choices and financial ones? 
And what's your advice for actors who would love to make a living not only working, but working on projects that really matter to them? So I got very serious there. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I don't know uh, about you, Gugu, but for me, yeah, uh, there's, there's several different stages to any particular job. Uh, there is your first introduction to the material, which might be quite inspiring, uh, or it could be the introduction to a paycheck, which might be quite inspiring. Uh, then the, your collaboration with the other actors and with the director, and then how, the result, the, how, how it's received and um, what the, the final product um, adds up to. And the, the, the projects that I've worked on that have checked all those boxes are very rare uh, for me. It's, uh, um, if you can work as an actor, you're, you're doing very well, period. Um, if you want to work on things that are really inspiring to you, my advice would be to keep your cost of living low and allow yourself the opportunity to um, exploit any inspiring piece of material that comes through you so you don't have to um, worry about uh, some of the necessities that all actors worry about, you know, from day to day, just rent the next day. I mean, it's the kind of profession where you are fired routinely, you're unemployed routinely, you really have to manage a lot of um, uh, free time yourself and uh, maintain your, your, your acting instrument and creativity. And there, there's not many jobs that are, are quite like it. So um, if you can keep your uh, cost of living low, I, 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 it has certainly benefited uh, me in terms of doing theater and plays that I, I like to do um, that I find incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I came from theater initially and, um, you know, went to drama school. And I think when you leave drama school, they, you know, you're just so thrilled to get a job, you know, and I think that the, the message of it or how inspiring the material is initially, I think is, is that's a real luxury to, to be considering. I mean, obviously I think everybody has boundaries and things that they're not interested in doing, but, um, but, you know, luckily for me, you know, I, my first job, as I said, was open air Shakespeare. And that was really inspiring to me at the time, just getting to do Shakespeare. I mean, you know, uh, and, and use those muscles and um, yeah. And I think, I think you can make, I don't know. I think I probably make nearly all my decisions, many decisions based on art, artistry over the other things. I think, um, I don't know. I probably should be more, um, uh, do, do, I, I, I just, I just, uh, I don't really get much satisfaction from doing things that I don't find artistic, artistically inspiring. So I, I think you're right, Billy. If you, if you feel like you don't have an extravagant lifestyle to maintain, or you're, you're locked into certain things that, that need a lot of maintenance in that way, I think it can give you a lot more artistic freedom. Um, it's just the potential of it, right, Gugu? I mean, because we never know how it's going to turn out. So it just the potential that something has an uh, opportunity to be wicked in some weird way, whatever it is, whether it's your character, whether it's the message of it, whether it's something experimental that people haven't tried before, whether it's you getting an opportunity to work with people who exceed uh, any of your own potential. So you have to rise to the, all of those things are incredible creative opportunities. And um, there's no way that you can control how it's going to turn out. So if you can just, uh, stake your claim on the potential of something being cool, of something having some uh, impact on uh, an audience who, who watches it, rather than trying to control how something will be received. I think you'll find, uh, well, you have to also make friends with um, uh, things sucking a lot too, because you know the more extravagant you try, the, the bit better chance you have of something uh, not coming together well. Um, so get, 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 become friends with failure. <laughs> uh, I am curious because, uh, acting is such an unpredictable, you know, often heartbreaking job. Did either of you ever consider doing anything else or has it always been, you needed to be an actor? Well, for me, I, dance was really my first love. So I, um, 
I went through a phase of wanting to be a ballet dancer. Well, not just a phase. I mean, I seriously danced a lot when I was a teenager, sort of six days a week. And, um, and I actually failed a ballet exam, which I, you know, when I was 15, which was like a very semi-professional um, ballet exam. And, um, and I'd always got distinctions for everything. And it was such a sort of shock to the system in a way, but it was great on reflection it was great at the time it was a disaster but you know it, it, it pointed me towards musical theatre and then musical theatre you know got me towards acting and so you know in a way you know I mean I think I would, I would definitely be long retired if I'd been a ballet dancer by now so in, in a way it was it was a good thing um and then you know I mean I know it was, sort of joking and I've talked to you a bit more about this uh, Janelle but you know um, painting and art was something that I really considered in my teens and it's been something that I've been able to do a bit more in quarantine <laughs> which has just been a wonderful sort of creative um, outlet but that but that was something again that I I considered doing but I ended up with acting because it was so much more collaborative and playful and I felt like um, you know I just loved my theatre friends I loved the energy I love the mischief I loved the um just 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 the playful nature of, of something so much more collaborative so yeah that's that's why I ended up here I guess do I see a canvas behind you are you working on something oh oh no that's actually a poster from a, a Prince concert uh but no um no um yeah you should have just been like oh I painted this yeah, I painted those no <laughs> Billy for you um, well, dancing, obviously, um, uh, but the, um, I, I went to graduate school because I thought I was going to teach. Uh, that seemed to me to be a much more stable profession. I didn't know anybody was an actor. Nobody in my family came from a creative uh, performance background. Uh, Would so you have can... taught? Would you have taught? Uh, I, I, I went, yeah, to teach, to teach acting. That's what right. I got the master's so I could... Um, teach at a college level. And most of the people that I really admired mentors of mine growing up were teachers. And I thought that was would be such a wonderful profession. And, um, uh, and the thing that I, I seemed to excel at most when I was in college was uh, um, not Western Civ, and it was not um, uh, physics, it was uh, performance. And so because I shared a love for performance and also uh, admired teachers so much. I thought that I was, that, that's what I might do. But the first day that I was in acting school, once I was around um, people who were incredibly talented and professional, it, it, be, it became crystal clear to me that I wanted a serious career as an actor. Um, I just needed to be around people who had the same kind of um, uh, ambition. Uh, we had a fun question here um, from Rashmi. Oh, good. <laughs> Wants to, uh, congratulations on great performances. If you had to play another character on the show, who would it be? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if we could, another existing character? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who would you like to fill in I'd for? Like to, oh, I'd like to play the ghost of Hannah Haunting Season 2. <laughs> I think that there's a way to bring, bring a supernatural element to Season 2 and just have her, like, in the control room. I don't know, like... Just playing some tricks on some people. <laughs> I think Alex, for sure. I mean, that's just a phenomenal part there. You know, I would, uh, and then I would get to have a duet with myself. And what could be more <laughs> exciting for an actor than to get to work with himself? That's what all actors ultimately want. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. I think we only have time for one more. So I, what? I saw one about... Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna credit the right person. Oh wait, no, this is a good one. Uh, Serene wants to know: um, We stretch and grow from every project. What takeaway about yourself surprised you the most doing this show? Hmm. Hmm. That I, I guess for me, it's that um, I can manage a little more pressure than I thought I could uh, as I get older, um, and uh, that 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 is that. As you age as an actor, you're, you change, your instrument changes, your, the parts that you have an opportunity to explore change. And there's uh, no way to predict how you'll respond to that inevitable shift in your career. And so to be able to find uh, adult characters that have the kind of complexity and playfulness that um, I'm allowed to grow in, um, not really even allowed, forced to grow in 
is uh, that that's a thrilling and rare opportunity. Uh, so for me, um, handling the the rigor of this part uh, with everybody who was involved cared deeply about what this show was attempting to explore. So when you get to be a part of something that you care deeply about and you're asked to do something difficult for you in it, it's, uh, it's rarely, it's, it's, it's a rare kind of rewarding. Mm. Um, I would probably say just the gift of having, I think I just didn't realize the gift and the potential of, of a character that, that has a secret, you know, and um, I think certainly for Hannah, you know, so often when you look at roles, you look at what's on the, on the page, you know, as a selfish actor, you know, what do I get to say? What do I get to do? And I think what was interesting for me is, you know, Hannah's journey was sort of reverse engineered in, 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 in knowing her backstory. Um, and then actually, you know, so often as an actor, you, unless there's a flashback you just the backstory is just internal for you you know whereas um I, I got quite a lot out of being able to sort of carry this this idea and this trust with Kerry and Mimi that, that this is where the character is going to go but um but but then actually get getting to explore it I don't know I've never I've never done anything in that in that sort of that way around before which um was was more rewarding I think than I than I thought it was going to be. And just to piggyback on that, uh, Travis has a question. Has there been a character you've played that changed the way you live, act, and think in real life? Because you've both played so many amazing characters. Billy, I'm from Oregon. Like, you're a hero for playing Steve Prefontaine. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you're all over my college. <laughs> that was a phenomenal uh, opportunity in part. That's a great, great question. Um, Goo Goo? <laughs> I mean, a character that changes actually how you talk in real life and how you act and, um, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like every character sort of, there is a residue of, you know, you learn something about that world you're in. I don't think anything has profoundly changed me as a person, any one role, but I think, um, I think it's more about you explore parts of yourself, you know, in a way, um, which is interesting. You know, you get to kind of look at a different facet of, of, of who you are as well. Um, but yeah, that's a tough one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that there's been one character that's, that's you know, shifted, shifted me permanently. I remember Just, doing a movie called uh, Waking the Dead that the character was having sort of a nervous breakdown during it. And um, that definitely opened my mind to nervous breakdowns. So uh, the kind of fragility of uh, any one life um, and how close all of us are uh, at any given time to losing the foundation of, I mean, I was younger when I did that. I think I was probably in my 20, uh, late 20s, early 30s. Um, and there's a certain level of confidence and hubris that comes with um, being able to work as an actor when you're 20s, you know, you feel a, a kind of bulletproof and uh, playing that character and having a kind of fractured psyche that that definitely um, introduced me in, uh, to uh, the instability of, uh, of, of any, any one period of time in your life. Inter well, uh, what's it like playing somebody like Dr. Manhattan, who's omniscient and all yeah. <laughs> you find you're a very pointed stuff and it goes to Mars. Um, the only ba bad part of it was that the, the getup that I had to wear um, was, was not uh, terribly um, um, complimentary. And so the other actors uh, did not pay me the, what I thought was the justifiable um, respect that Dr. Manhattan should have when I was wearing six inch lifts and had 180 dots all over my face and the I, uh, blue blue lights blue I was a, I was just a walking light for them essentially so that 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 um it, w it was great other than having to deal with um the the other actors in there I would think it would just be a cool headspace to be in like That's I know and control everything well also too it's it's not something you um uh spend much time thinking about as a human being when getting through life practically takes up 
every portion of your day. So to play a character who is really disinterested in the minutia of life and uh, is more preoccupied with the internal workings of uh, a star um, gave me a, um, a, 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 a wonderful opportunity to check out. I love that. Um, I want to remind everyone watching at home that all episodes of season one of The Morning Troll are available on Apple TV+. Plus. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you. Thank you.